great job. Uh, Brittany, we didn't have any internet outage here in Fairbanks, but the wind has been unbelievable. I think we're getting a little more of it soon. Okay, I think we're um, ready to start. I realize that some of the classrooms um, have students still coming in and everything, but I think we'll get started. And uh, this is Janet and Sarah. We're with uh, Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. We're here in Fairbanks, Alaska, and we're joined by uh, several researchers um, around the uh, and they will introduce themselves and, and talk about uh, what they're going to present in a little bit. But we want to welcome you to the International Polar Week. This is our second event that um, is for students and the public about, about the polar regions. Um, we are celebrating um, the the equinox, and it's a global celebration that happens actually twice a year because we have a spring and a fall equinox, and we're celebrating the fall equinox right now. So everybody around the world has the same amount of daylight, and we encourage you to go to um, a variety of websites. The website that is um, at the bottom of the screen that is being hosted by Apex has a variety of activities and webinars, and you can learn about what the equinox means um, in the polar regions as well as do some fun, fun things. And at the end of this, we'll remind you um, to launch a virtual balloon for participating in the Polar Week event. Um, a little bit about the platform we're using. It's called Blackboard Collaborate. And some of you have been here for a little bit now and have hopefully seen the slides change in the center of your screen. Um, if you have any trouble with that or things aren't working, there is a chat area at the bottom right usually, I mean bottom left, and you can type in your questions there. You can um, let Sarah and I know if you're having any trouble, things like that. Um, can go in the chat area. Um, there's a list of participants just above that, and you can scroll through it and see who's joined us today. Um, if you have a chance to, um, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question um, live instead of typing in the chat room, you can click on the little hand icon above the list of participants, and that raises your hand and lets us know you have a question. When it does come time to talk, Click on the talk button once, that opens your mic up, and when you're done talking, click on it again, and that closes your mic. Um, this event is being archived, and we will post it um, on the websites and all, the, all different places and let you know um, if you have to bug out early or something, then you'll be able to look at the archive at the end of the day. So if you have questions, um, during the presentation, we're going to let the uh, researchers pretty much do their presentation because we've got four of them today. So type your question in the chat box, and at the end, we'll um, make sure we have time to answer some of those questions live, and we'll call on you. Again, click on the little hand icon and talk directly into your computer, mic, or phone. And I think that's it for how this works. Um, we do want to know where you're all from. Sarah and I happen to know where you're all from because you signed up on a registration sheet, but not the researchers and others that have joined us. So as we go along, please type in your name, where you're from in the world, and who has joined you in this virtual room that we're, we're all in together today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brittany. Yeah. So Brittany, um, go ahead and turn your video and talk on. And uh, if there's other questions, uh, Renny and Karita, you're welcome to type in the chat box too. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. I'm Brittany, and John's here with me. We work together on Arctic Lake. Um, I began studying science when I was in college, and at this time I was also figure skating, so I've gotten to do a little play and work at the same time. Um, and my quote here says from when Arctic Lake told me about myself that my most rewarding experiences so far in my life revolved around my pursuit of studying science. Um, and my interest in science began with love for clouds and storms, so basis when I was in high school for deciding to study science in college. 
Um, and if I could pick anything that I've done this past, yeah. Um, you are breaking up a lot. We can't hear you. So either um, you may end up having to call in by phone, and we can give you the phone number so that you can join us by that way and talk. Or um, I don't know. There's something. Your audio is just not coming in very well. So Sarah is typing in the number for you if you can join by phone. Yeah, it might be the internet. So so. Brittany and John are in Barrow, Alaska, and they're trying to uh, do their presentation from there. But sometimes the internet doesn't work everywhere. So, yeah. So Brittany is up in Barrow with John, and John is, as far as I understand, John is um, one of her advisors or mentors in this project. And so it sounds like Brittany's done a lot of different work on her way to becoming a, a researcher up in the Arctic. So uh, in a minute, they'll tell you a little bit about where they're from. So they're not from Alaska. So it doesn't mean that you have to be from the polar regions to be able to study these things. And one of the reasons why we wanted to have these presentations was so that you, students, would be able to understand kind of what it takes to be a researcher in the Arctic. There's a lot of, or the Antarctic. There's a lot of work that people do to be able to uh, go to these amazing places. But it all starts with maybe a teacher or a scientist that you've met. So we're hoping you get to meet these people. All right, Brittany just called in. Is that her? Yes, hi. Perfect. All right, Brittany, we're going to turn it right back over to you. Okay, great. Um, I think I'm ready to go on to our beginning slide, if that's okay. Perfect. Sure. Um, so the title of the talk that John and I are going to give is Alaska's North Slope, A Landscape of Lakes. Um, and as I was starting to say, John is my coworker at University of Nebraska, and we study lakes in Alaska together. Next slide, please. And I'll introduce myself again. I'm Brittany, um, and I started studying science when I was in college, um, and that was based only on I like the clouds and I like the weather. I actually wanted to be a storm photographer for National Geographic. So I thought, I guess that means I should go to school for meteorology. And so I did, and I went to a school in Pennsylvania, um, which is my home state. And once I graduated, I was still interested in learning more. And so I went to University of Nebraska and started studying lakes with John. And now I'll hand it over to John to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is John Lenters, and I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. I grew up in Michigan. So that's where I first got my love of lakes, growing up in the big lake in Holland, Michigan. And I lived in Madison, Wisconsin for a while, where there's also a lot of lakes, and also St. Mark's, Michigan, where we have the outflow of the largest lake in the world, Lake Superior. So now we're up in Barrow, Alaska, and as you can tell, we're pretty far away. We're up at 71 degrees north latitude, where the internet is kind of slow, so it's now talking from a phone. But I'm going to pass it back to Brittany now to start talking about Alaska's North Slope and, and what that region is all about. Hi. Okay, so this next slide first shows a map, and you'll see that there is a black hatch line on the map. That's the 66 degrees north latitude line, which is also called the Arctic Circle. Um, and John mentioned that we're all the way up at 71 degrees north. Um, so in that red box, yep, right there where that finger is pointing, we're nearly at the northernmost point on the state of Alaska. Um, and this area is called Alaska's North Slope. Uh, it's land that's sloping towards the Arctic Ocean from the Brooks Mountain Range. Uh, it's so cold up that trees can't grow, um, so vegetation is usually pretty short, and it's also, as I said, very flat. Um, the photos on this slide are the Arctic Ocean sea ice down at the bottom, and then the three inset photos are some pictures I've taken just around the town of Barrow. Yeah, so the one that the hand's pointing at um, shows the skeleton of a whaling boat that the native communities use here in Carroll, um, and also the whale bones making an ark. Um, and then the one above it is just a photo of a native coat. So it says Native Village of Barrow, Alaska on it. Um, and then on the right, that's the whale watching tower that they have on the beach. Um, so in addition to being up here to study science, we get a new cultural experience, which is really interesting. Um, next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, here we have a, a view of the landscape up here. And as you can see, there are no trees, and it's really flat, um, and there are a lot of lakes. Um, that's why we're studying the lakes up here. There are so many of them, and they're so far north that we don't get up here to study them uh, enough. You can see that there are thousands of lakes up here. That, that map on the bottom right illustrates this. Uh, this is um, a satellite mosaic of the lake. So all the little blue dots are actually lakes. Um, and again, this is called Alaska's North Slope, and some people call it the Arctic Coastal Plain of Alaska, too. Okay, so on the bottom left, that photo is a lake here in Barrow, and it's actually the one that Don and I are studying while we're up here for the um, current two to three weeks. I didn't mention on the last slide, but this landscape up here has an icy rich soil underneath it. Um, so that means that it's really hard. It's actually like cement. Um, so that means water can't penetrate easily through it. Um, in the summer, though, it thaws. And when the ice in the soil thaws, the ground starts to plump. And this is what causes the lakes. Um, we call these thermocarst processes. But a simple way to put it is freeze-thaw processes. So again, this is what causes the lakes to form. Okay, next slide, please. All right, and now I'm going to hand it over to John to talk to you about why we're studying these lakes. Okay, hi again. Um, we are mostly interested in the weather and climate of the region and how it affects the lakes. But first of all, why do we study the lakes? Well, lakes are really important. And if you look at some of the points up in the upper left corner there, they're important for fish and birds. They provide habitat. They're also a food source for local animals. They provide recreation and drinking water, not only up here in Barrow, but throughout the world. Lakes are very important to people. And then also they affect the climate through heat and moisture. And there's a picture in the lower left there that shows some of the heat and moisture coming off the lake in Barrow. That's uh, locally known as Freshwater Lake. And you can see the clouds or fog in the distance. A lot of that moisture comes from the lakes themselves. And so what we're doing is we're putting buoys out on these lakes. And there's a yellow buoy in the lake right there that we had out this summer. And we just retrieved it yesterday because it's getting close to freezing. And we don't let these freeze into the lake. We have other instruments that we put out in the wintertime. But the instruments collect a lot of weather data, like air temperature and wind speed and pressure and sunshine and water temperature, as well as wave activity on the lakes. And so we use a lot of this information to try to figure out how climate affects lake levels, how it affects evaporation, ice cover, water temperature, and a number of different uh, parameters that we measure on this lake. So that's an idea of some of the science we do. We're really interesting, interested in the long-term question of how climate variability and climate change may affect these lakes. The landscape is made up of about 40% lakes or drain thaw lake basins up in this region. So it's a dominant feature of the landscape. So I'll pass it back to Brittany now to give an idea of our field work. If we go to the next slide, um, I can mention some of the things in this particular slide that show how we actually get out to our lakes. There's a picture in the upper left corner that shows snow machines. So we get out in the wintertime. Um, I think we need to go to the next slide here. That's showing up on our screen. There we go. OK, so the upper left corner shows the uh, snow machines that we take to go out on these lakes. So in the wintertime, we actually get about six feet of ice on these lakes. So it's a lot of ice. Uh, it's very stable. We go out on snow machines and we, we drill through the ice, as you can see in the picture in the bottom there. We put temperature strings in the ice so we can measure um, the temperature and, and the ice stick. And there's a picture of Brittany up in the, just to the upper right there that shows her standing by one of those small red buoys. And the buoy keeps it afloat once the ice melts so that we can get the data back in the springtime. And just below that is Brittany in a boat going around the lake just as it's thawing. So it thaws from the edge inward. And you get a lot of thick ice in the middle of the lake, but water around the edges. And so we're going around the edges and looking for some of our instruments that we put out in the wintertime. And in the summertime, for some of the really remote lakes, we take a float plane, which is in the left picture there. Um, sometimes we've taken helicopters to get to some of the remote sites, and sometimes we hike around the lake, as shown in the lower left corner there. Um, and there's some ice 
that has flown to shore just as the ice broke off in that lake. So I'll let Brittany explain that upper right picture, and then we'll pass it off to some other folks. Hi, everyone. Yes, that upper right picture is me with the Polar Trek teacher, Christina, this past summer. Um, so that was in July. And when we're not out doing field work, we get to do some fun stuff, um, like getting certificates that say we went to Barrow and we crossed the Arctic Circle. Um, so as John mentioned, we do a lot of fun things when we're out at the lakes. Um, I think one of the best parts of our jobs is getting out in nature and doing some hands-on science. Um, and that was also one of the uh, tickers for me to stay in school and keep studying science was that I wanted to do field work. I wasn't quite sure how to do it, but um, it worked out because you just keep trying. So we are open for any questions, please. All right, thank you, Brittany and John. And um, again, if there's questions as we go along, you can uh, type them in the chat box, and Brittany and John can read that and respond to that while while we hear from the other um, scientists as well. And then at the end, we can ask questions to any uh, anybody that's presented today. So um, next, we're going to go to uh, Rennie. So welcome, Rennie. Let's see, is this working? Can everybody see me and hear me? Awesome. Uh, well, my name is Renny Tyson, and I am a PhD student at Duke University. Uh, I study, actually, behavior in general of marine mammals. Um, but specifically, right now, I am lucky enough to study uh, humpback whales and how they eat uh, in Antarctica. Um, so if we go to the first slide, um, so I thought I'd talk to you guys a little bit about uh, how I got to do this, um, how I got here today, um, and additionally, um, some of the work that we are doing right now uh, in Antarctica with humpback whales. Um, on this slide, I included two websites if you guys wanted to jot down. Uh, the first website actually is a blog of two field seasons that we spent in the Antarctic. So colleagues and myself from Duke University and a few other um, institutions spent about six weeks in, the, uh, in May and June in 2009 and 2010 in Antarctica. And so we uh, created a blog and put lots of fun videos and pictures up so if you're interested. And then the bottom site is just my personal website, which has a little bit more information about me if you're interested. All right, the next slide, please. Um, so honestly, I um, come from a very small town in the in central Florida, where the blue pinpoint is. Um, I was not really exposed to research as a child. I didn't really know what it entailed or what it existed. Um, but then I went to college. At, oh, my voice is breaking up. Should I call? Slow down. Just slow down a little bit. That's okay. 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 Um, so for college, I went to Florida State University, which is located in Tallahassee, Florida, where the green uh, pinpoint is located on the map on the right. Um, and while there, I was, uh, as a freshman, my first year in college, I was part of a um, program called Women in Math and Science and Engineering. And it was a program designed for students like myself who were kind of interested in science, but I didn't really know, you know what was out there, um, to get some experience. So it was through this program, actually, that I got uh, teamed up um, to do some work in uh, Dr. Doug Nowacek's lab at Florida State. And he's actually, uh, uh, there's a picture of him on the lower left-hand corner with myself. So he was a new professor at Florida State, uh, and he was studying acoustics in marine mammals. So as a freshman, I ended up working in his lab and becoming very interested in the type of work that he was doing. Um, he mainly focused on um, sound and how it affects marine mammals. So as an undergraduate, I ended up doing a thesis with him, studying uh, vocalizations of killer whales and right whales. 
And then I ended up being lucky enough to stay on with him to do a master's project looking at um, the abundance of bottlenose dolphins in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, then it turned out, right as I was about to graduate, he got a job at Duke University and a very big grant to go study humpback whales in Antarctica. And because of my relationship with him, he kind of invited me along and said, let's go and you know, do this work and you'll get a PhD and we'll go tag whales in Antarctica. So that's essentially how I ended up um, getting to do this. So by teaming up as an as a undergraduate um, with, with a professor. All right, next slide. So this has some technical jargon in it, so I'll try to uh, break it down. But this is the name of the study that we are um, conducting in Antarctica. So it might surprise many of you, but um, even though humpback whales and other whales are gigantic, we actually know very, very little about what, um, what they're doing underwater, specifically how they're eating. Uh, so for this study, we called it multi-scale and interdisciplinary of humpback whales and their prey. So humpback whales actually feed um, in Antarctica on Antarctic krill. And these are essentially like, um, like shrimp. You can think of them as shrimp. So for this study, we uh, had physical oceanographers, uh, krill biologists, and whale biologists all working together um, from many different institutions, which you can see down below, to try to understand the relationship between whales and their um, krill, and, and how the krill may affect the whales and vice versa. This was especially important right now because um, along uh, parts of Antarctica, um, the climate is warming very rapidly. And krill, when they're juveniles, they rely on um, algae under the ice to forage, and so they need ice for their survival. So with warming temperatures in the Antarctica, in the Antarctic, we're ending up with less ice, which then may mean less whales in the future. So we wanted to try to understand what these relationships were. So the next slide, please. So we uh, thought out to try to get at these questions by looking at both the whale's behavior and the krill's behavior. And so for the whale's behavior, in the top left picture, we use what are called digital acoustic recording tags, um, which is really just a, a really cool um, little device that we attach to the whale with this pole that you can see um, my colleague Ari Friedlander tagging the whale. Uh, these tags attach to the whale via suction cups, so they actually don't uh, hurt the whale at all. Um, and they stay on the whale for about 24 hours. And they record all of the whale's behavior, such as the depth of the whale, um, how it, uh, which direction it's going, if it's rolling around, um, and any sort of behavior like that. And after studying, uh, after the tag is on the whale for about 24 hours, the suction cups actually just pop off the whale, and the tag floats to the surface, and then we can go get it. Um, once we have the tag, if you look at the bottom left corner, we're actually able, with some very high-tech, um, great computer uh, programmers, uh, recreate the tracks of these whales in three-dimensional space. So now we can actually see what these whales are doing underwater, which is really exciting for us to actually be able to get this kind of um, 3D data. So at the same time that we have uh, tags on these whales, we wanted to figure out what um, how much krill was around these whales, and maybe how much it was eating. So we used what are called echo sounders, which are really uh, essentially high-tech fish finders, um, which tell us uh, what is in the water and how much of it is in the water. So on the top right, we have these echo sounders or fish finders that are attached to the boat, and they drive around and circle these whales. And then when we look at the data from those, we actually get an idea of what was in the water. So if you look on the bottom right, uh, this is a picture of what the krill in the water looks like. So we get an idea of the depth of the krill, 
And then um, how much krill is in the water. From this, we can also see the ocean bottom. So you can see the thick brown line essentially represents the ocean bottom. And then the dark red uh, and green and blue is actually estimates of krill density in the water. So combined by combining the krill behavior and the whale behavior, we can start to get an idea of what these animals are doing. Uh, next slide. So, so essentially, we are just hoping that by observing these animals um, and by putting the uh, information of the whales and the krill together, uh, we can get a much better understanding of, of how these animals respond to prey. And then to be able to kind of predict what they, how they may respond if um, ice continues to melt and krill are no longer able to survive. Uh, so just some some fun pictures up on the right. Uh, this is actually a picture of me and um, on the bottom right of that picture looking for whales on our ship. Uh, I'd like to note that we often stand it up on the the bridge of the ship. Um, you can see two people standing. This was often quite cold and, and windy. Um, but this is how we find the whales. So just with binoculars, um, it's pretty simple. And anyone really could be trained to do it. And then the middle picture is just uh, another great picture of how we tag these whales um, and the process of that. Uh, and this takes a lot of skill of both boat drivers and um, all people on board. Uh, but again, this is something that you know anyone interested in this type of work could be trained to do this type of work. And then finally, on the bottom right, this is really our goal of how we're accumulating data. So the, the red colors, again, are um, estimates of krill over the depth, um, for all depths, over a, an entire day. So the y-axis, the bottom line, actually represents time. And then the, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then those thin black lines you see are actually uh, estimates of whale dives. So we're able to now see where the whales are diving and see where the krill are and be able to um, combine those two things. So really, that's, that's the summary of my work. Um, and I will say that it's uh, fantastic being able to work in the Antarctic. Uh, and to be honest, any of you interested in science, um, speak with uh, your teachers um, and try to, you know, get experience in their labs, and you never know what can happen or where you may end up. Yeah, I think that's the last slide. What did you Why is it so hard to figure out what the humpback whales are doing? Hey, hey Julia. It, it's hard mostly because we can only see these animals when they are at the surface of the water. And in reality, much of their life is spent underwater. About 95% of their life is spent underwater. So we have no idea what they're doing for about 95% of the time. So these tags now allow us to kind of visualize what these animals are doing underwater. So we can see them both now while they're at the surface and virtually see them while they're underwater. What's your favorite part about working with the whales? I 
that's probably that's actually a tough question because there's so many fun things. Uh, I would say one of the fun things is um, actually sharing with everybody some of the cool things we learn about these animals. Uh, it's it's amazing how little we know about what these giant whales are doing and how they spend their lives. And um, it's really fun to be able to figure out what these guys are doing and, and to share that with people like you. And Henry, I see your question down in the um, chat asking, are there differences between the humpback whales in Alaska and the ones that migrate to the Dominican Republic? And yes, there are differences. In, in actuality, those are two different um, stocks or populations of humpback whales. So humpback whales in the, north, um, in the northern hemisphere, uh, essentially, if you're in the Pacific, will migrate from Alaska move down to Hawaii, so they'll go up and down in the northern hemisphere, or I guess the, the Dominican Republic is in the northern hemisphere, I apologize. Um, but uh, the ones in the Dominican Republic then would be on the Atlantic coast, so they're migrating up and down um, to areas like the Gulf of Maine and up near Canada, and then right back uh, down to um, areas like the Dominican Republic to breed uh, and whatnot. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Um, cool. <laughs> uh, my name is Karita, and um, I guess first and say, uh, as you can see, I, I started my schooling for college in Florida, and I did my bachelor's, my undergrad, and my master's in marine biology, and. It was really cool because with my master's, I got to work with sponges. Um, they're in the ocean, so I'd actually go diving to collect my sponges in Florida in the warm, sunny weather. And then somehow my research with sponges <laughs> got to lead me to do research in what? And in the Arctic, where it's very cold. And right now, I'm actually living in Canada, um, in Quebec. So I went from living in Florida to live in Canada and I go sampling in the summer in the Arctic. It's very cold. <laughs> um, so uh, the next slide. Yeah. So it's the big thing is I'm researching very different things, but you never know like, where your research will lead you. And if you just go with the flow, the main thing is that I just love science. And I like the idea to me that science is like solving a mystery where there's a big question to be asked and you get to use science to solve this mystery. So you're kind of like a detective. And that's really cool to me. And so for me, for my doctor at my PhD, my question is how much greenhouse gases like CO2, which is carbon dioxide, and methane, uh, CH4, are coming from these tiny ponds in the Arctic. And you can see in the picture, um, my study site in the Arctic, we use a helicopter. It's, uh, in the bottom of the picture, it's like the foot, the landing gear of the helicopter. Because um, where I research in the Arctic, you can only access it by helicopter. So we get to fly in on this island. And so then you can see the aerial view of all the ponds. It's really interesting because in parts of the Arctic, you wouldn't think, um, yeah, there's a lot of land, and a lot of this land is covered by these small ponds. And these ponds emit a lot of CO2 and methane. So um, next slide. 
Um, so this methane, I'm going to focus on methane because that's my favorite part of my project. And so the question to know is the only way to know how much methane is coming from these ponds is to know how they are produced. And you have to measure that. And so methane is produced in the soil of these ponds because methane has to be produced where there's no oxygen. So it's produced in the soil by a bunch of these microbes in the soil. And so then the methane, once it's produced in the soil, it has to go through the water to get to the atmosphere. But how does it do that? There's actually two different ways it can do that. Um, so first, there's dissolved methane. And that's where these tiny, the bacteria produce the methane. And it's in these tiny, tiny bubbles. And these bubbles in the soil, then they go through the, from the soil to the water and then to the atmosphere. And, but these bubbles are so tiny that you can't see them. So they call it dissolved. Dissolved methane. But, yeah, dissolved methane. And then there's the other way where you have these huge bubbles of methane. And here, the methane is still produced in the soil by the microbes. And you have, but in the Arctic, if during the winter, the ponds are frozen with ice. So you have these tiny bubbles of methane produced in the soil, but they can't get out of the soil to the atmosphere because it's blocked by the ice. So these bubbles, these tiny bubbles combine, and they form big bubbles. And so then as soon as the ice melts, you have these huge bubbles of methane coming through the water to the atmosphere. OK, next slide. So here on the right side, I have some real, real life pictures of the methane bubbles. Um, yeah, so it's the methane bubbles. It's not air. It's not oxygen in these bubbles. Um, about 90% of it is actually methane. Um, and it's kind of get hard to get the pictures of them because they're just releasing sporadically from the soil. And then this is. Yeah, this is my favorite part of my research. So that's why I wanted to share it to you. But, um, in the big picture, um, this is me collecting the methane bubbles. Um, we had to go onto the water in this floating, um, floating boat. Floating boat, uh, but, uh, you can't. The thing is, you can't walk on the sediment because then it releases all the methane. So you have to go on the boat, even though the pond's really shallow. And we have this. Um, a funnel that's underneath the water, and it traps the bubbles. So we trap these bubbles, and then um, next slide. Go to the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> so we trap these bubbles, and I put them in these bottles. And so from these bottles, we have the methane, and I take it back to the lab, and it'll tell me. Um, how much methane is being? <laughs> I'm very happy about my bubbles. Um, <laughs> they're very hard to collect, actually. <laughs> Once we take them back to the lab, I'll tell you how much methane can give you ideas about how much methane is being released from these ponds, and also how they're produced. Um, so we know what we need ideas about what bacteria or microbes are producing the methane and how they are producing it. What Carbon source. Um, okay, so next slide. Next slide. Um, so this picture, I think it kind of shows a lot. So I wanted to show it to you guys because this is my research station. Um, as you can see, there's a helicopter. So we, it's the only way to land uh, to get to this research site. And then the building. Um, this is the building. And there's never. On average, there's about only 12 people, 12 scientists that can be there. There's not that many people, and there's no one else around you for miles and miles. And then this building, all we have is a kitchen, um, a shower that works sometimes, not all the time, um, and a few tables to, for our samples. And then you can see our tent in the yellow. We sleep outside in the tent, and it's pretty cold at night. Um, and 
And you can see the three of us at the bottom, we're walking, after collecting our methane bubbles, we're walking back to the lab, the research station. And I think it's very interesting, um, even though there's only 12 of us, so there's only 12 researchers maybe there, and we all have to help each other out. I think that's one of the most important things I learned uh, being an Arctic scientist is you travel to these remote areas and the only way for your research to work anyway, it's pretty complicated, is to work together with other scientists and so we help each other out a lot and yeah, we help each other, we work together and it's very interesting because I get to work with other scientists that work with Arctic foxes, birds, lemmings and plants and by helping and working with these other scientists you really get to see how everything is connected. Um, but for instance, the plants, what plants are present can affect how much greenhouse gases are produced in my, in my pond. And so I guess the big thing is like why do I do my research and of course I think every scientist wants to believe um, of course, one day my science, my science, my research will help save the world, right? But, <laughs> yeah, that probably won't happen. But you can see, I can see by working with all these other scientists that one day all of our research combined really will help make a difference in the Arctic environment. And, yeah, that's why I feel that I can feel sampling is very, very exciting and very cool thing to do. Great. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thanks so much, Carita. That was really neat. So, uh, this is a great chance for people to ask questions. And it looks like Henry has one in the chat box right here. His group, his students are saying, don't the ponds contain algae that can consume carbon dioxide? Carita, you can answer that. Yes, yes, that is true. Um, well, actually, only some of the ponds have algae, and some of them don't. <laughs> but um, in the summertime in the Arctic, remember there's 24-hour sunlight. Um, but while they do could consume, they also produce it, and so there's a balance. And depending how this balance is, it depends. But then also, the methane um, can be produced by the bacteria, or it's actually archaea, um, the type of microbes that are like bacteria. Um, the archaea can use CO2 to make methane. So the algae can make CO2 that then it turns into methane. Thanks. Perfect. So it looks like Julia is um, typing, Henry is typing as well, he says thanks. Um, and Brittany is not going to call back in, but she can hear and will answer questions through the chat. Barrow is a long way away, so it's a little tough up there. Yeah, so Brittany is available if you have questions. Julia's group is asking how long were you and are you in the field? Maybe we can start with Carrie to just let us know how long you're in the field during the year. And then we could go to Rennie and um, Brittany, you could tell us in the chat box. Go ahead, Carita. Okay. Um, actually, my first summer research, I was there for about three weeks. But then my last, this summer, um, I was there for about a month, a little bit over a month. Wow. How about Rennie? How long are you in Antarctica? Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, we spent about five weeks in um, May in 2009 and 2010, both years. Um, and during those five weeks, we actually lived on a ship the entire time. And so we didn't really, well, I don't think any of us really see that many other people during that time. But uh, we were also confined, confined very much in the amount of space we could <laughs> use. All right, and we'll let Brittany um, type in how long she's in the field. Any other questions? It looks like Henry has his hand up. Go ahead, Henry. Hi. 
Hi. I want to know if there's a difference between the homes in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Yes. The student wants to know if there's a difference between the humpback whales in the Atlantic and the Pacific since they, their migration routes uh, don't seem to mix if there's some kind of evolutionary difference between those two uh, sets of humpback whales. Great question. So, Remy, it's for you. Hi, Henry and students. Um, they are they are still considered to be the same species, but there are um, a few, I think, genetic differences. But essentially, they are the same the same animal. They just have have different habitats and different migration routes. And what's interesting, even those migration routes. We're still learning a lot about uh, where these animals are going, and we may not even have a good understanding of that. So there may be some mixing, especially in the southern hemisphere, um, but not as much in the northern hemisphere. Thanks. All right. Carol, does your group have any questions? While you're over there, you can type them if you'd like or um, use your microphone if you want. And Claire, it's great to see you there as well. Let us know if your students have any questions. Looks like Carol is typing. Maybe they have a question over there. Julia's group. And I think I see some other Tysons on the call here too. So uh, if you have any questions for Rennie, go ahead. Okay, here's a question for from Julia's group. Do you have a tough time getting used to the weather? Maybe let's talk with um, Brittany. You can type your answers in. And also, why don't we have Rennie? Do you have a tough time using uh, getting used to the weather? Uh, personally, I did, mostly because I, I come from Florida and I'm used to the heat. So Antarctica was a big difference for me. Uh, but we wore lots of warm clothes, uh, gloves, hats, and with all those clothes, it really wasn't uh, really that bad at all. Um, but I did enjoy going back into the ship with the heaters, I will say. <laughs> all right, Karita. Was it hard for you to get used to the weather? <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> yes, it very much was. <laughs> um, the hardest part for me was at nighttime when you go we to sleep in tents, and in the Arctic there's still ice on the ground. Uh, underneath the ground there's ice, um, so the coldness still comes through that. But you have to have a, a bunch of layers and you're sleeping wet underneath to help that out. <laughs> That's great. Okay, Carol, go ahead and ask your question. Um, one question was, how long can a humpback whale stay down when they're diving? Hi, Carol. All right, that should be for Rennie. Hi. So it depends on what the animal is doing underwater. If it's doing, if it's feeding, then it may only stay underwater, um, let's say, about two minutes to six minutes, just because it takes a lot more energy, and so they need to breathe sooner. But if they're just traveling or swimming along, then humpbacks can stay underwater on average about 11 minutes. Great. How about we go to Henry's group? Go ahead. Oh. Um, hello. Um, I want to know if the sonars that are attached to the whales are only used to track their location, or can they also be used to track their behavior patterns? Uh, 
Um, I didn't quite hear your question. Could you repeat it? Uh, the student wants to know if the sonar uh, that attached to the whales, if they are only used for their location, or can they also uh, record something about the behavior of the whales? So the tags can do both. They actually have a whole bunch of sensors on them that can uh, tell us uh, uh, stuff, for instance, when they are foraging. They also have um, what is called a hydrophone, or uh, essentially it's an underwater microphone. And so it records any and all sounds in the environment. So for instance, if the humpback whale um, makes a vocalization, we can pick that up on the tag. So, Renny, while you're there, there's two questions for you. Uh, one is, do you have to wear any special gear when interacting with the whales? And then another group wants to hear about humpback whale reproduction. So, two questions for you. Gear and reproduction. All right. Well, the gear question. Um, when we're close to the whales, you can see we're in these small little boats. And so, for protection, we wear these what we like to term the big orange monkey suits. And these are just essentially float suits that uh, if we happen to fall in the water, they would help us float and help us be seen by emergency um, people coming in for emergencies. Also, you can see uh, Ari, who is on the front of the whale, or on the boat, he is actually tethered to the boat because he is up trying to, he's almost falling out of the boat, you can see in this picture, trying to tag that whale. So we do tether him into the boat. Um, but otherwise, uh, that's all the gear. Uh, as for the reproduction um, question, so humpback whales uh, breed, or they, they mate in the tropic regions, so in areas like the Dominican Republic uh, or Hawaii. Um, they do that in the summertime, and then they migrate down to areas like the Arctic or the Antarctic during the winter to forage. Uh, so all of the breeding occurs in those tropic regions. Perfect. Carol, it looks like you have a question. Go ahead. How many calves can one humpback have in one lifetime, and do you ever tag the calf? Good question. So the humpbacks can start having calves probably around age uh, six to eight, and then they could have them every two to four years, up to, gosh, probably, probably up to the age of 50. So I would say maybe five, six, Humpbacks or calves? We actually don't have a good answer to that question yet, though, just because we haven't been able to follow individuals for that long of a time. Um, and then, yes, we did actually st uh, tag both a mother and a calf once at the same time. And we were able to look at how they uh, interacted underwater. And it was really cool because we found that they were very, very synchronized in their behavior. So the calf just stayed with its mom almost the entire 24 hours that we examined the animal. Perfect. So I think that's a great chance for us to wrap up this event. We have some students with buses that are heading to come get them and take them home. So thanks for joining us. and. Um, I want to say thank you to our presenters and to all the students for joining us. Remember, there's so much more to do with Polar Week this week. So um, check out the website of all the different things to do. And remember to launch a virtual balloon at this site and let us know that you participated. Um, thanks so much. The archive will be available soon. And thank you so much again to our presenters. So we're going to end the recording right now.